Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Future of XYZ. We are here with uh, an amazing human being and medical doctor and master's of public health, uh, Dr. Stephen Phillips. Stephen, thank you so, so much for joining us on Future of XYZ. Yes, thank you. And I hope I can live up to that introduction. Well, I think with the, the multiple decades of experience crossing the private, public, and academic sectors uh, as an epidemiologist and as a public health practitioner and as an internist, I don't think you're going to have much of a challenge. My challenge is going to be trying to keep up, especially as you recently, let's call it, come out of retirement to play shortstop on something really important that I'd love you to talk about, which is the COVID collaborative. So. Perhaps we can start this conversation. Everyone's been living with COVID, but what is COVID and what is your role at the COVID Collaborative as, as, as it pertains to this? Right, so COVID has been a global pandemic that I think most of us know all too well. That's been around for about 20 months and originated in Southern China and now has killed uh, something like five or 6 million people on the globe and has probably infected about a billion or more human beings. Uh, the US, as you also probably know, has a fair share of that, about 20 to 25% of that total, which is pretty incredible given that we're only about 4% of the world's population. Um, so, but what COVID is in terms of uh, uh, epidemiology and developmental biology is, uh, is a viral pandemic of the kind that has swept the globe uh, all too often, usually in the form of influenza uh, and uh, especially the last big one was about a hundred and, oh, exactly a hundred years ago, the Spanish flu, which killed something like 50 or 60 million people. So about 10 times as, as much really as the current pandemic. So basically it's a virus that unfortunately has a human host and is capable of human to human respiratory transmission. And anytime a virus jumps species and it is capable of pretty easy human to human transmission, you're gonna have something like this. And I think the smart people recognize as early as January of 2020 that this was gonna be a global phenomenon and that it was coming to a theater near you which it unfortunately has. And it must go. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think I'd love to get, you're a scientist um, by training, by practice and at heart. And I would love to understand, you know, what is the scientific point of view on COVID right now with the multitude of disciplines that matter? Right, well, the fascinating thing about COVID that I think most of us have seen is that uh, over the last, uh, one or two years, almost everyone that we encounter is the smartest person in the room. I have not seen many people who are especially educated and curious who haven't assimilated their own information, largely from the media and sometimes from pretty reliable and pretty smart sources. But the incredible thing about a pandemic like this is that in the terms of the way that we organize disciplines as uh, a society, it's as cross-cutting as anything you will ever see. And, and as you noted, Lisa, we've got uh, relevant specialties ranging from immunology to ep epidemiology, to virology, to vaccinology, to preventive health, to civil engineering and ventilation, to uh, what are the kinds of fibers that should go into masking and how should the mask be made and uh, the polyethylene used in masking. So an incredibly broad array of very, very hyper-specialized human competencies are being drawn together. And it's very hard for the average informed citizen, never mind journalists, to really assimilate this in a way that can make accurate and scientifically meaningful assessments and predictions. In, in real time also, because this has been one of those cases where, you know, you talk about the Spanish flu back in the early 1900s, social media didn't exist, the internet didn't exist, which 
you know, perhaps is helpful for disseminating positive information. But of course, to your point, how quickly the experts and the non-experts have to understand things in a fast moving uh, topic is really tantamount to what's happened, I think, in some ways with COVID this year. It's beautiful uh, to, to bring in the whole concept of uh, modern communications, uh, digital media, social media, internet. Uh, as a thought experiment, I reflected on what the Spanish flu would have looked like if, it, if they had access to our media. Imagine, uh, you know, a, a disease that wiped out 10 times as many <laughs> as COVID and what, what that would have looked like uh, 100 years ago. Uh, but you're right, I think, uh, you know, my concern is that uh, the modern technology, communications technology, has amplified the good, which in many cases is scientific r and I mean, Science has progressed remarkably and has given us advancements like these miracle vaccines that would never have been available in the history of mankind. That's the upside. The downside is I see more rapid spread of fear, anxiety, negative information. And I don't mean disinformation. I don't mean intentional. I just mean plain old misinformation that uh, emphasizes the scary and the negative and underemphasizes the hope and the positivity that, that might be derived. Well, I think that leads us to an interesting um, counter to the science which is, of course, this sociology, if you will, of the disease, of the virus, rather, of, of COVID, which is really about human beings' response, right? And you go back to the basics, there's fight and there's flight, right? And, and, and both are kind of triggered and stimulated by a fear mechanism. What is the, the, the sociological experiment that is uh, unfolding before our eyes? And what is the role of fear in that, in your estimation, as a leading epidemiologist really trying to, to battle this, this virus? That's a great question and my personal kind of pet peeve, which is that uh, I think we're, as human beings, and especially as... Uh, Americans, where we are used to a culture of risk aversion and have a relatively low risk tolerance in, in many respects. Uh, we have, uh, I think, amplified a lot of fear and a lot of negative reactions to a virus that has a broad range of risks depending on uh, race, ethnicity, especially age and underlying uh, conditions. But my thought is if, if we had access to good information and were somewhat less risk averse and somewhat more rational as a, uh, as a population, we actually would have handled this on the whole much better as a family, as a country, as a community than we actually have. Can you give me an example of, of what you think if we weren't so uh, risk adverse, if you will, or fear mongering um, or fearful, uh, how might that have looked differently? Yeah, so uh, many examples and please understand a lot of this is not pure science. It's science merging with personal risk calculus that all of us have societal factors, cultural factors, religious issues, political issues, party identity, partisanship, a whole bunch of things. But class. to give you a class, absolutely. Uh, a whole bunch of markers like that. But um, one thing I try to do is kind of strip away the human component of many aspects of COVID and just look at the numbers. So for example, um, just looked at this recently. You know how many uh, people under the age of 20 have died of COVID in the US since the inception of the pandemic about 20 months ago? Well, we have about 750,000 deaths or 752,000. So I'm gonna guess that less than 5% of those are under the age of 18. Okay, so 5% of 750,000 thousand running the numbers quickly is like 35,000 or so 35,000 yes so the actual number is 500 oh. 
So the, but, but your reaction I think is quite uh, typical, which is people don't realize that there's a thousand fold degree of difference in, in risk between under the age of 20 and over the age of 80, a thousand fold difference in risk. And one, one thing I like to look at is comparable activities and what risks they have. So comparative risk, because that's a good way of framing it. So do you realize that twice as many uh, young adults and children under 20 die in motor vehicle accidents than have died of COVID in a year, twice as many? You realize that about the same are, number are struck by lightning. Uh, <laughs> the, um, what else? Drowning. Okay, there are two to three times as many in that age group drown. Well, we and so, and but, I had an episode a couple of weeks ago on mental health, and unfortunately, a whole bunch more are dying of suicide and self harm. So, okay, uh, okay. It's depressing, but <laughs> that's another, but you know, these are all negative and depressing stats. But what I like to do, you know, as a scientist, and it only gets you so far, is just look at the data, and the data are really good basically the younger that you are the more relatively risk-free you are of covid but if you look at the level of apprehension and anxiety and fear in society and there have been really good public polling results on this it's almost uniform across all age groups so even though there's a thousand fold different difference in risk there's only about a 20 percent difference in risk perception Yes, and behavior. Interesting. That's one example. If you'd like more, I could keep you awake late at night. There's, <laughs> a, there's a lot more like this. No, it's really interesting because it really talks about psychology. And I think this is the first time in the modern world. I mean, I think some of the statistics, again, that are very uh, devastating. I mean, the U.S., as you said, has only 4% of the world's population, or a little 3.5%, and yet we have 20 25% of the cases, followed closely by India, the most populous country in the world, Brazil, U.K., Russia. You know, China, the world's actual most populous country, is not in that top five list. And it's very interesting because so much of this has to do with culture. Also, I think, you know, we talk about who are the people most affected. It's the elderly, for sure. But this is disproportionately affecting, you know, communities of color and frontline workers, you know, people who class wise don't have the luxury and protection of, you know, being being behind, you know, their quote unquote gated or gilded community. And I think as we look towards, you know, the what would have happened in the Spanish influenza with social media, you also have to say there wasn't the same wealth at that time, much less the same access or information. So all of this plays into human psychology, as well as the fundamental structure of our societies in, in many ways. So COVID is an, a weird scientific experiment of kind of horrible proportions for the modern world in some ways. Well, again, to, to amplify on that point, you know, I think uh, COVID has been a natural experiment for governance across countries and culture and politics across countries. So we constantly, early on especially, we read about China, Singapore, Taiwan, Sweden, New Zealand, Australia, and they were hailed either as being paragons of relative effectiveness in what they were doing, or actually they were derided for not caring about their people and driving towards herd immunity. And uh, what I think the media failed to realize is that what they were witnessing was this grand natural experiment that Darwin would have loved to go around on the Beagle to document, which is the virus was the same. And by and large, the human mammal host was the same. What was different was the society and the ecological framework that this was unfolding country by country, and then the reporting and how they handled all these uh, very interesting differences. Yeah, no, I think you, you've nailed it. And, and I want to talk about something else that's really different in this, going back to the science of it. Something I personally have found um, confounding, which is we know how it transmits. We know how to prevent it. There are multiple vaccines now. Most of the world, the developed world has access. 
Some are getting boosters. The developing world see, still needs a lot of access for a whole bunch of different reasons that have much more to do with public health and governance, as you say, um, and, and distribution. But my, my curiosity and the, the thing that really perplexes me is watching how COVID seems to impact people so uniquely. You know, it's like some people get certain, you know, uh, symptoms and other people get other ones. And then the even response to the vaccination or the long haulers, which are these people who have these long term effects, like, why is it affecting people? You know, we can talk about the sociological, psychological, and cultural aspects, but physiologically, why is it attacking and impacting people so differently? Well, great question. And, and I would answer that in two parts. I think COVID is really three different diseases. One is acute COVID, where you actually are symptomatic and have what is a severe flu-like illness. And that could range from mild to moderate to severe. The second type is very severe COVID, which winds up in the ICU, frequently requires ventilation and intubation. And then uh, unfortunately, not very rarely actually ends in death. And that COVID is not the actual virus doing the damage, but it is a autoimmune reaction. It's an overreaction, uncontrolled reaction of, of our own immune system that is in response to COVID, but not due directly to viral damage. And that, that is actually what kills people. It's not the virus, it's our own out of control, deranged uh, immune system. And the third one you raise, which is the most problematic and is probably gonna give us the longest uh, tail of the COVID pandemic is, is the long haulers which have a very, very inexplainable, complicated set of symptoms that can range up to 150 to 200 different symptoms affecting all organ systems and coming on very unpredictably and presenting in very protean diverse manifestations. And no one frankly has a good handle on that, but I'd like to at least conceptually have us think about three very different patterns and types of diseases, acute COVID, severe COVID that's brought on by an autoimmune reaction. And third is long haul COVID, which is really yet to be defined, but can be extremely diverse in its uh, manifestations. Thank, thank you. I actually didn't, uh, it makes perfect sense. And actually I will not ever hear a reader think about the, the virus again in, in the same way, because that helps explain it actually, uh, it, quite a lot. I mean, you have such, again, this storied background, if you will, I mean, beyond your achievements, you've worked for the New York City Department of Health, you've worked at the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, you've worked in the private sector, I mean, you worked at Exxon for many years, plus think tanks. As we look to the future of COVID, which is, of course, the topic of future of XYZ, the long haulers form this horrible um, bridge of the topic, because you know, we're looking at later this week, you know, today's November 4th, November 8th is when the U.S. is finally reopening borders to international travelers. I mean, it's been almost two years that people have not been able to come to the United States and there's been restrictions all around the world. I mean, as we use that as an example or the long haulers as that bridge, what is the future of COVID? Well, the future of COVID is actually Pretty good. I, I think that there's a fairly good consensus emerging in the scientific community that COVID-19 is going to pass from pandemic to endemic. And what does endemic mean? It means living with the virus, much like we're living with many things that are causing a fair degree of harm, but we've uh, acculturated and accommodated to accepting that harm. Influenza, mumps, uh, measles, even some other vaccine preventable illnesses, uh, we don't get frightened. We don't like it, but we don't go around every day uh, worried, sick about it. So, uh, and it looks like uh, epidemiologically within the next, uh, anywhere from three months to a year, 
we no longer probably will have a pandemic. We will have an endemic where people will get COVID. They by and large won't get sick because of uh, nearing herd immunity, a combination of uh, immunization, which uh, so far something like 60% of Americans have been fully vaccinated and ultimately probably 70, 75% might be. And then uh, besides vaccination, there's natural infection. There's something like 30% of Americans, some overlapping with those that are vaccinated that are also naturally infected. So we're gravitating not too slowly toward herd immunity. So endemicity, living with the virus is, I think a fairly positive future. I, I would say society, I would be, I would be uh, waging right now in Las Vegas that a year from now, you and I are going to be mentally and physically virtually normal <laughs> along with the rest of the country and pursuing our activities much like we did before. And this will not recede into a vacuum, but I think people will, uh, it will no longer be a topic of daily conversation, shall we say. I, I mean, that's, if, if you were anyone else, Dr. Phillips, I would probably be a little bit suspect, but the, that's very promising given how close you are to this and your own uh, background. I would ask just one last thing. I mean, should uh, people are fearful still, right? And but people are also hungry to get back to normal or whatever this life is of of gathering and in person contact. You know, we have the Delta variant, and now there is in England perhaps another variant out of that variant. This seems just like the flu has to be updated, the shot has to be updated every year. This seems like the future is not only, it, it's not a pandemic, it's an endemic, but it will continue to mutate. So we will be living with mutations of, of the, the original virus. Is that accurate? Right, but again, let me try to be reassuring that, uh, and also practical. I like to leave people with practical, useful, uh, implementable information. So what should the average person do? Get vaccinated if you're not. Get a lot of rapid tests because you're gonna need it. You want the assurance that you and others in group events uh, are not infectious, not just infected, but infectious. And rapid tests are gonna be rapidly available to you, inexpensive. So that's gonna open up both physically and mentally a good deal of a sense of well-being in society. Third, resume your normal activities, you know, mask wherever you need to. Don't stop living life. And I would say to the fullest. And I think if you're, you know, under 70 and don't have uh, underlying conditions, the future is now. Go for it. But do it, do it advisedly with the prevention tools that I just mentioned. Um, well, I can't imagine a more positive place to end the conversation about the future of COVID. Dr. Stephen Phillips, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today. It's been my pleasure. Great being with you. And you have great questions. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and everyone watching um, or listening, make sure that you subscribe to Future of XYZ, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, etc. Subscribe and follow on YouTube, Instagram, and you can also nominate future guests at future-of.xyz. Dr. Phillips, again, future of COVID, it is not as dire as we thought even just 12 months ago. Thank you uh, for your expertise and your time. My pleasure, Lisa. Thank you.